Eric von Denigen's hypothesis will have an increasing effect on society, science, literature, and art. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence is a concern that affects all of humanity. For me, it's like souvenirs of the past. Some of our human forefathers had contact with extraterrestrials. They were here, they visited us, they were in contact. Something happened in the deep past and it will happen again in the future. Author of the sensational international bestseller and the most compelling non-fiction publication of all time is back in London for the first time in 25 years to celebrate Chariots of the Gods 50th anniversary. Eric Von Denigen Legacy Night. In this two-hour special, you are invited to share with Eric his most influential discoveries and revelations. Learn about his incredible life journey as an author and researcher. Meet the team behind the highly anticipated Chariots of the Gods 360 degree entertainment franchise. Eric Von Denigen Legacy Night. Live streamed from the Princess Anne Theatre, BAFTA 195, Piccadilly, London, October 15th, 2016. For more information and to purchase tickets, please visit ZoharStargate.com. Mr. Sirisena, who gave me such a nice introduction, failed to tell you that he is one of the major researchers uh, who have worked on the images brought back by the Viking spaceship in 1976. And in fact, although I did bring a selection of slides over here with me, uh, most of them were geared toward the academic audiences I've addressed, and all of them were in black and white and shades of gray, almost all of them. So uh, this morning, he sat down with me and provided me with a number of his own slides to which I didn't have access previously. And so what you're going to see are uh, many slides processed expertly by uh, Mr. Sirisena, and I thank him very much for this and also for ferrying me, oh, I, I must use the word whisking me, no, nope. collecting me and then whisking me all about England in his vehicle. Uh, this is a little strange to me because in America we don't get collected and whisked. <laughs> 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 um, collected usually means picking up a lot of things that fell on the floor. <laughs> but uh, I have been collected and whisked most ad adequately by Ananda Sirisena. I want to show you a couple of other books or papers that have been done on this subject. This one is called The Martian Enigmas, and it is a marvelous collection of the very best images of this material that have, has ever been published. It's by Dr. Mark J. Carlotto, who is a, um, an image processing engineer, a PhD with many, many peer-reviewed articles to his credit in the field of applied optics and image processing. And um, he is still an active researcher, having begun working on this topic since uh, 1987 or so. And I have another paper here, which I'll explain later, but it is by that same Dr. Horace Crater, uh, whom um, Ananda uh, quoted, gave you a quote from earlier, although those who came in a little bit late didn't hear it. Other than that, I'm not working from my notes, because my notes were for an academic lecture, and this one is more fun, and I hope more informative. So I think we'll... Um, begin in a moment with the slides, but first just a very brief introduction to the subject. Um, in the 60s, and am I doing okay for sound? Yes, thank you. NASA sent up some missions to Mars called the Mariner spacecraft. 
And the mariners came back with apparent evidence that Mars was a barren, lifeless world, cratered and pockmarked and very like the moon. And the NASA scientists quickly concluded that it was like the moon in practically every respect and therefore could not sustain life. However, in 1970s, around 1976, the Viking missions to Mars sent two orbiters and some landers, and they brought back information that seems to contradict this. And included in the images they brought back were the ones that have these unusual objects. And I will show you both the unusual objects and also the evidence that Mars may not be such a barren, lifeless world after all. So with that slight introduction, uh, let's move to uh, the slides. This is a composite actual photograph of Mars. You can see some cratering here. And uh, this is a NASA uh, photograph. But that's the planet. Now, that reddish color is real. Um, the surface of Mars is largely uh, iron oxide, which is uh, a ferrous um, mineral, uh, iron mineral. But it's also an oxide, which is an interesting thing, because it seems as though a lot of oxygen got, um, got trapped in the, uh, in the mineral content and might be recoverable. This is a map of Mars. This area, Elysium, it's called, was an area where the Mariner craft found some strange pyramidal-shaped mountains that looked uh, very regular. And at first, uh, people jumped at that and thought, oh, pyramids. However, they are three-sided pyramids. And wind erosion on the Earth is um, uh, capable of creating three-sided, faceted, pyramidal shapes. So they may just be wind-eroded features but they are called usually the Pyramids of Elysium. Over in this area, Cydonia, that's where the main objects have been found, and we'll be looking at that area almost exclusively today. Now, here's that barren surface of Mars taken from one of the Viking landers, which was actually sitting there. Um, this must have been taken from a black and white photo because actually uh, the photo shows reddish uh, rock, although if I'm not mistaken, they had to interpolate the color from various cues they get from the hardware. But you can see it looks like a desert and uh, rocks, jagged rocks all over, not an inviting landscape. Now on some of these rocks, there are little markings and one researcher, um, well, one individual who has recently written a book on the subject uh, believes the Martians uh, were out to uh, represent the ancient religion of the mother goddess and has interpreted some of the markings on rocks in this area as uh, hieroglyphic inscriptions. My view is that those uh, are entirely fanciful and they are an example of what the mind can do by trying to impose a pattern on an object, uh, come up with something that suits your particular interests. And I personally uh, give little credit to that particular line of approach. I hope to show you today that the actual research that's been done by legitimate qualified scientists is of a different nature than these imaginary or, or wishful thinking kinds of, um, of interpretations. Not that I want to limit people uh, exercising imaginative thought on this, but we just have to be very careful. And uh, the people I've uh, been working with are, I think, very careful. And this is a color enhanced image of the volcano called Olympus Moans on Mars. And I have it in here for a couple of reasons. The color that you see is not the color of the actual object. 
but rather is a, an interpretation of the gray levels in the image. Of course, the image came through as varying levels of gray. Actually, uh, I believe it's 256 levels uh, that can eventually be received from the data that comes in in the form of binary numbers, actually, from the spacecraft. But this mountain, this volcano, is immense. Uh, it could be thought of as a, as a continent almost in itself. I forget the exact dimensions. It's the largest shield volcano known in the solar system anywhere. And a shield volcano is the type of volcano with the large splash around it, um, which could be considered a shield. The volcano Mauna Loa in uh, the Hawaiian Islands is a shield volcano, but this one is many times larger than that. Very impressive. I'd love to be there and be able to look at this incredible object. I believe it comes almost 25,000 feet high above Martian sea level. Immense. Now here we have some of the Viking pictures, and you see what appear to be rivers, stream beds. There's a very clear one here. And um, over here are objects in a stream bed that are eroded just as such might happen in a teardrop shape as the water flows around, uh, a, a materially accumulating on this end and, and not on this, being worn away here. These are craters, so what was happening was that the water was, was eroding away the material around the crater, evidently. And um, at first, uh, the scientists were uh, puzzled, and they thought, maybe it's not rivers, they, because they were so convinced that Mars was absolutely barren throughout its existence. So now we see we're moving away from the idea that Mars is entirely like the moon. It does have an atmosphere, although very thin, it's composed mostly of carbon dioxide. And um, within that very, very thin atmosphere, I think the pressure is less than, uh, well, a, a very small fraction of Earth's air pressure. Um, within that, there are dust storms that can run at 700 miles per hour. So even though the atmosphere is very thin, dust blown at 700 miles per hour can create significant erosion. So you have weather on Mars, clouds of vapor that appear to come from the um, ice caps uh, melting, frost melting, and uh, then turning into vapor. Uh, and uh, actually, I believe the way it works on Mars is it goes directly from the frost to the vapor and creating some clouds. And clouds have been seen in low-lying areas. There must have once been significant running water on Mars and probably lakes and even perhaps shallow seas. This then is a, um, an imaginative projection of what Mars may have looked like when there was water. They can do this because they know the relative um, altitude and they've established a mean Martian sea level. And you notice that the northern hemisphere has a lot of it and Cydonia is in the northern hemisphere, Cydonia being the area that we will be focusing on most. Uh, so it's thought that in that area where these mysterious objects are, uh, that it was very close to a shore. And in fact, some of the objects, the ones in the area I termed Utopia, were found because the scientists who looked for them uh, looked for a similar terrain where they're was a shoreline, an ancient shoreline. And lo and behold, when they did explore similar terrain, they did find some objects that were similar in uh, their mystery character. By the way, let me go back to that a moment. There's been talk of terraforming Mars so that we can um, live there ourselves. So we may be looking here at the next planet that humanity will live on, and if they succeed in terraforming it until it has oceans, this may be about what we will look like and what many humans may call home. There is a wonderful set of books by a science fiction author, Kim Stanley Robinson, who wrote Red Mars, Green Mars, 
So you can see from red after centuries of work, it began to turn green with vegetation. And then I think his next book will be called Blue Mars. And so we may be seeing here what would be Blue Mars. Now, in 1996, this year, NASA announced that it had made an astounding discovery. What did they find? What did NASA scientists find? They thought they'd found microbes in meteorites. So they announced to the world that NASA scientists had found microbes. Well, why am I acting this way? Well, because it was in 1966 that a, an Hungarian scientist, uh, Dr. Bartholomew Naj, began working on some of those meteorites. And it was in 1975 that he announced his conclusion that these objects, if found on the Earth, if they, if they, if they were earthly rocks, would immediately be judged as very likely containing um, microbes or fossilized microbes. And uh, then in 1990, uh, Vincent Di Pietro and, and John E. Brandenburg, who are among the early researchers on these uh, enigmatic objects we're going to be looking at, announced that they had studied the meteorites and al also actually consulted with Dr. Naj, and they gave papers arguing that there might be signs of life in these meteorites. And in 1995, of all things, in a Disney World special video production, the Disney company announced that NASA was quietly working on these meteorites before NASA had announced it. I don't know why NASA let Walt Disney know about it. I often wondered. And in a leap of reasoning that could only be generated by Mickey Mouse himself, they have said in the Disney World special that uh, these microbes that were dropping on Earth from Mars probably were an advance invasion of viral and bacterial diseases sent down to us by Martians to test us out in, a, in advance so that they would know whether they could come down here themselves. <clears throat> I hope that that wasn't NASA's view. I don't think it was. Well, what do these NASA meteorites mean for the Mars anomaly investigation? NASA tried very carefully to separate their find of life, possibly evidence of life, in these meteorites from evidence of higher forms that might have occupied Mars at some time in the past. They said, we don't mean to look for little green men, which was a kind of a travesty because no scientists have postulated that they're finding evidence of little green men. But they tried to separate the meteorite evidence from the idea of any higher life forms that might have been on Mars in the past. But that technically, the finding of the, of the meteorite bacteria suggests that on Mars there was a period when life might have evolved or at least Mars might have been congenial to occupation by living beings. And so the meteorite evidence is, if anything, supportive of the theory, not detracting from it. It doesn't negate it. Now here we have one of the first lapses in NASA's logic. When NASA made its first comments on this, some of the spokespersons tried to imply that because all they had found was microbes, that would mean that there wasn't anything but microbes. That is a logical fallacy. I hope you can all see that. That's incorrect logic. Um, suppose you reached in your pocket and pulled out a penny. That wouldn't tell you that there was nothing in your pocket but pennies. You could reach in your pocket and find a quarter. <clears throat> No, you couldn't, could you? <laughs> no, you'd find a 20 pence piece. Oh, God, and I, sorry about that. I keep looking for a 25 cent piece. I can't find one. <clears throat> sorry about that. 
but it was hard for me to pick up those pounds because they're so heavy, right? <laughs> uh, it didn't take long. It's not bad. I rather like the pound coin. It, it has a feeling to it. It's, it's, it's got a weight, and it makes me feel I've got something in my hand. But anyway, you get the point. You can't infer from having only found a penny that that's all you've got in your pocket. And that's the logic involved when you say, if all we found was microbes, then there's nothing else. Now, this is the area of Cydonia that's involved. This is NASA Viking frame 35A72, which means it's the 35th orbit of the A orbiter and the 72nd image taken by that orbiter. 41 latitude north, 9 degrees longitude, and this is the entire frame. Right here, you can see the first glimpse of a strange object that's been called the face on Mars. We'll move closer. Here's a little closer view. You can all by now identify there's the face, and by now it looks face-like, I think. And then in the area, there are a number of other objects. A little closer, this is angled a bit differently. Here's the face. Uh, but this one here is of special interest, and we'll be looking at it more closely. I'll tell you in advance, it's been called the fort. That doesn't mean anyone thinks it really was a fort, but it looks roughly like one, so it got that name. Here's the face. Now, this is a, an unenhanced photo. It's not even processed. These dots are transmission errors where the data didn't come in. It got obscured by static or something. Those had to be removed, and it's possible to remove them uh, and interpolate what was there. And this is a very rough picture because it hasn't been subjected to mathematical enhancement to try to show more detail. NASA has man maintained that it's a trick of light and shadow, but that has been disproved by at least four different methods of testing, including the painstaking building of an accurate model, uh, a scientific model, designed to duplicate the exact shadowing at the two different lighting angles we have for, there are two frames which have different lighting angles by the sun. And um, a sculptor, a perfect, professional sculptor, uh, did this. It took her two years. She made about 12 different versions until she had it right, and she would um, mount appropriate lights on a jig to get the exact angle and did so until she was able to duplicate the shadowing found in each frame with the one model, which is a very severe test. And her conclusion is that there is simply no way that you could produce this shadowing unless you had an object shaped the way it appears to be shaped, shaped like a face. And that was only one test that was performed. And so we know very well by now that it is not an illusion of lighting. Could it be wind erosion? It could be, but if there's detail in it that is consistent with the idea that it might be a deliberate facial sculpture, then that would tend to weaken the idea that it was wind erosion, because you would have to back off with each uh, detail and say, well, the wind did this, the wind did that, the wind did the other, until it begins to get improbable that that all could happen together in the same place. And that's what I think we have here. This is image 35A72, and you see a long shadow. That's because the sun was low, almost to the horizon, 6 o'clock in the evening. And um, so the, the right side is rather dark. But in here, you can see what appear to be striations that are somewhat like teeth. In some images, you can see them quite clearly. And in fact, in this one, you can. But it appears to have something like teeth in the mouth. And furthermore, these objects don't appear anywhere else, either on the face or elsewhere in the vicinity, on any of the other uh, mounds or knobs in the area. And so it's a rather unique uh, thing to have these shapes. And they happen to be in the area of the mouth. So that's uh, consistent with a sculpture interpretation and not terribly easy to explain by wind erosion. There are other details. There are cross lines that cross just over the central axis 
The lines are dim, but we can see them. I've called that the diadem. It's almost like a, an Egyptian uh, a headdress with a stone in the middle or something. Uh, we, don't, we don't see that anywhere else. And then there's a very humanoid-shaped eye socket. Um, it also has an eyelid that is, again, perhaps not so visible in this representation. This is the other frame. The sun is at a higher angle, and we get some detail on this side of the face. Now, there's a distortion down here produced by a camera registration mark, which they cannot remove. So we don't know for sure what's happening here. We have seen, though, that the mouth continues. Actually, the teeth go over a little bit. And there is a line here, and I hope you can see it, but it matches this one. It's parallel. And so the headdress or helmet appearance is actually quite regular. It's quite symmetrical. It's really got parallel. And the width of these is the same on each side also. So although we don't have complete information here, we have some symmetry. And it helps us see there is also another eye socket, although it appears to be misshapen a little bit, but it's still about in the right place. So there's some symmetry to this. Now we see in this color enhancement by Ananda Sirisena the complex structure around the eye because, um, as I mentioned, the different colors are actually different levels of gray, different, different um, degrees of reflectivity of the object, so they represent structure. So there's complex structure. And if you look closely, you may see a darker area here in the center that you might say, my goodness, that looks a bit like a pupil in the eye. Could that be? There are NASA scientists who, when they were told there might be a pupil in the eye, have given it the horse laugh and said, you must be out of your mind. But here it is. There actually is a dome structure in the eye, which is right in the spot for a pupil and is round like a pupil. The little gash you see at the top is actually a shadow of a small protrusion right up here. So the whole object actually is round, quite round. If you've ever seen a contour map, the lines around it, so it's actually got quite a peaked character to it. And uh, it's right smack in the middle of the eyeball. So that's consistent, again, with the idea that we have something um, anomalous, something strange, something peculiar. Uh, it has a pupil in the eye socket. The eye socket's shaped like a humanoid eye. It uh, has an apparent lid, if you look closely. Um, very strange situation. And you see, the wind erosion would be, oh, it's being eroded by the wind. Well, the wind happened to go inside there and make a, an eye pupil, and it happened to go over here and make teeth. Uh, that begins to get a bit absurd. It doesn't prove that it's artificial, but it proves that it's anomalous and needs to be looked at. Now, this is the general area. And we're now going to move and look at some other things. And first, I think it is this one here that was called the fort. You can all already see that there's something like a regular wall going uh, fairly even in its width, looked at from directly above, and enclosing an area with a peculiar straight channel cut right out of the side of it. We don't know what all this stuff is, but this looks like it may be uh, stuff blown from the north by the wind and accumulating on the side of some, some structure. Here we have a spectacular object. It's been called the D&M Pyramid. It's uh, for Di Pietro and Molinar, who discovered it, right near the face, about eight miles south. And look at the symmetry of the five points here. See these five points? Uh, we've called these buttresses, but they aren't buttresses uh, in the sense of architectural buttresses. They probably resulted from debris falling away from the centers of these faces. These are facets of a pyramidal shape. This is about 1,500 feet high, and it again is about a mile long. So a cartographer, Mr. Errol Torin, who works for the Defense Mapping Agency in Washington, D.C., projected what he thought was the original shape of it. This is a color enhancement of the same object. Again, you see these five points. This is quite a regular face here, by the way. So he projected a model, and this was what he thought it would have originally been shaped as. 
quite geometrically regular. And he analyzed the geometry and found all kinds of geometrically interesting information. However, this is just a model. The apex here of the pyramid is not an existent feature. It's in the area which has sloughed away, so we don't know if that's where it really was. Some people who are enthusiasts about this have been going around saying, or, or giving the impression, that this is the way the thing really is shaped right now. And there are under uh, certainly thousands of people uh, who, who believe now that that's the shape the thing has. And of course, if it did have this shape, we know it would be artificial. It couldn't be anything else. And so they now believe there's been proven that the, these objects are artificial. But that's a, a, a somewhat irresponsible route to take because this is merely a model of what it might have been like, and we need to prove that first. And so far, it has not been proven. But it is a very unusual object. A five-faceted figure does not normally result from wind erosion, and therefore, we don't know what caused it, and it's a very, very mysterious. This is a four-sided pyramid that's quite regular at the base. It seems to be on a square platform, square at the base, four very clearly defined faceted sides, almost all the same size, unusual. It's been called the NK Pyramid and was discovered by a person who works at the North Kelvin Side School, High School in uh, Glasgow. And his students, or students working with him, his name is Chris O'Kane, students working with him uh, produced these pictures in a project they did uh, at the school. And I have a close-up of that four-sided pyramid. This is it up closer. You see the faces of it. And again, it, it is an object that geologists say cannot be easily accounted for by wind erosion. Wind erodes three-sided pyramidal shapes, but not normally four-sided. And in fact, one geologist said he knows of none on the Earth uh, that, that we could point to that are four-sided. So very peculiar. And this is also right in the vicinity of the face and the fort. Here is the Great Pyramid at Giza. Uh, I can't say we found it on Mars, uh, but I, I wish I had a photo of it from above because it would probably resemble the uh, NK Pyramid I just showed you quite a bit, although it's certainly not as large, but it's certainly, it is very large, but not as large as that. Some people have suggested there might be a relation between the Egyptian pyramids and the Martian structures. We don't have any adequate proof of it. It's very suggestive. Um, we really need to get up there and look uh, before we can find out if there's anything to that idea. This is an object called the Siracena Quadrangle uh, because Anna de Siracena discovered it. And um, it. Um, is a cut into the side of a mesa. Again, it's in the same vicinity. And um, it appears to have a wall or a pier coming out. I don't know if you can see it. There's a hollow that has very regular striations around the entire perimeter. Uh, this is a most strange object. But the most interesting thing about it <clears throat> uh, to me is that at the end of this pier-like structure, there's a, a structure that has some kind of symmetry. Here's a little closer view. Uh, right here is this structure. It appears to be star-shaped. There's that pier. Here's the cut into the side. Pretty regular. Looks fairly deep. Some people have speculated that if this was at a time when water was there, like a, uh, a lake, um, it could have been a harbor. And here's um, a pier and another one. Uh, to pr provide a docking basin. Um, that's an interesting imaginative speculation, anyway. <laughs> I'm going to look over on this open plain here. This is the fort, and this is the area uh, beside it that contains some interesting objects. But out here in this open plain are some very interesting objects. They're a little, they're small, they're very bright. And they look like little mounds, about 100 feet high, and they're very uniform. It's been proposed that geometric regularity, uh, some kind of geometric grid, would be a way of possibly finding signs of intentional design. 
Uh, this has been put forward by a number of scientists, not just um, Mars enthusiasts. If you could make measurements from uniform-sized objects, and they're small, so that you know about exactly where the center of them is, you can get a more reliable kind of geometry that could be evaluated, perhaps. So Dr. Horace Crater of the University of Tennessee Space Institute began a research project on that back about two years ago. And it finally took the form of a rather lengthy paper called Mound Configurations on the Martian Cydonia Plain, a Geometric and Probabilistic Analysis. And I'm pleased to say and proud to say that it's signed Horace W. Crater, the University of Tennessee Space Institute, and Stanley V. McDaniel from Sonoma State University, because I helped Dr. Crater to some degree, a small part of it, but I did sign on to the project, and I have some comments in here myself. So here's A and D and E. This down here is B, and this one up here is G. So the first thing that was found was that this particular group makes a very close to isosceles triangle, which is a triangle with two angles the same. And the two similar angles are these two, which we labeled R, and we labeled this one L. And so we called it an LRR triangle. And I hope this doesn't get too uh, math, math sounding, but I'll um, do the best I can. But this was called an LRR isosceles triangle. And the question is, how closely does a perfect LRR triangle fit on the mounds? So Dr. Crater developed a method of testing that. We'll see it in a moment. But he then measured from here to here, and we found a right triangle. And um, so we have an isosceles triangle butted up against a right triangle, and it's done in such a way that something unusual happens. The triangle formed by AEG is a right triangle, and the triangle formed inside of this by GDA is also a right triangle. The 90 degree angle is here, and they both have the same angles. So they're what we call in math and geometry similar triangles, where similar means specifically they contain exactly the same angles. So now we have another ideal figure. Uh, the mounds aren't quite in the right place. How close does this ideal geometric figure fit the mounds? We've called this the pentad, G-A-B-D-E, because we have G-A-B-D-E. So that's what we call this structure. What we're going to start showing you is tetrahedral geometry, or the geometry, the geometric characteristics of a tetrahedron, because that's what we found here. So we're looking in the mound configuration at structures or angles that fit inside of a tetrahedron. Question is, how closely do the mounds actually fit this ideal geometric figure that contains the uh, angles of a tetrahedron inside of it? There's three right, well, actually, there are four, but there are three right triangles here that are identical. That means the same size as well as the same angles. This begins to look like something that we should apply probability to to see if it's likely that that could occur by chance. So we call this the hexad, because there are six mounds involved. Here we've shaded this one. This one is also there, and this one, all three of those are identical. But does it fit? I hope, I, I hope I've got the slide where it shows you that it fits. <laughs> Let me tell you in advance. It fits with extreme degree of preci precision. It's very tight. Uh, Dr. Crater developed mathematical methods of testing the fit. And uh, the degree of fit is very, very precise toward the, the estimated centers of the mounds. In other words, the vertices or the, uh, the points where the lines meet on this general figure fit on the mounds toward the center very closely. We then discovered, and this was my contribution to the paper. I was the one who found this. I was looking at this pentad figure, which you see here in the bold lines. And all of a sudden, my eye, which, by the way, is trained to see things in um, 
in diagrammatic form because of my training as a philosopher I often represent um, uh, in teaching uh, things by using diagrams so I'm very familiar with that and my eye caused me to jump into this rectangle here and there are no mounds at those points but I started exploring the nature of that rectangle. It represents what's called a square root two rectangle. The short side, if it's counted as one, then the long side is equal to the square root of two or um, 1.414. The pentad of mounds is such that five of the mounds fit precisely on five of the uh, corners and midpoints of the larger figure, the square root two rectangle. Furthermore, when we include the hexad out to this mound here, it fits on a corner point of a larger square root two rectangle. And it happens that the orientation of this grid, this angle of the orientation, matches the angle of orientation of many, many figures, including the face, the fort, and some of these pyramidal shapes here, which in itself is of some interest. What's also of interest is that Dr. Crater then calculated the probabilities. He ran 200 million computer simulations or models of distributions of five mounds, where the uh, computer was throwing the mounds out at random on a, uh, an equivalent area, and the mounds that it was throwing out were um, the average size of the mounds here, so that it was all uh, very similar in character. And after 200 million throws, uh, there was not one single duplication within the degree of precision of this figure. Uh, with very deliberate and careful mathematical calculation, he concluded that the chances of this figure of mounds being caused by random forces was over 200 million to one Again, against its being formed by, ra by random forces. Then he decided to include all of the mounds in the entire area with the exception of four here that are too close together to measure properly. So he included a total of 12 mounds, which are all the remaining ones, <coughs> including the original ones. And he used another method which is a good scientific procedure. And he calculated what's called the standard deviation, or a z-score, it's called. The, the um, anomaly is what they call almost five standard deviations away from the uh, expected norm. And according to Dr. Crater, who is a prof professor of physics at the University of Tennessee Space Institute, this almost five standard deviations is so far beyond the possibility of chance that it is virtually impossible that these mounds are the result of chance random distribution. Now that is a piece of information that is independent of the issue of whether the face is artificial. It is of objects in the area of the face, which tends to suggest the face is in a context of extremely anomalous structures. In terrestrial architectural tradition, the square root two rectangle was one of several figures that were used to express what they felt was aesthetically pleasing in proportion. And also, it's been proposed by a researcher here in England, John Legone, who is an Egyptologist, that the layout of the pyramids at Giza were, was um, developed the way that they are set with relation to one another, so that they're within a rectangle that is square root two on one side and square root three on the other, and square root five on the diagonal, and that that was developed architecturally by first inscribing or laying out a square on the ground and then taking its diagonal as the side because the diagonal of a square is the square root of two. And as you know, the square root of two is what they call an irrational number, so it isn't easy to calculate, but you can calculate it very easily by drawing a square. And then its diagonal is square root of two as compared with the side of the square. So it was used by architects uh, to develop these proportions uh, simply by starting with a square. 
And if you start with a square and then you generate this from it, uh, you can then from that generate a uh, square root three rectangle and square root five rectangle, and all of those were in use architecturally up into the Middle Ages and uh, considered to be uh, highly aesthetic, if not even symbolic in their nature. So we have here a geometric pattern in a grid that's almost virtually impossible that it could have been random, and it has a cultural meaning, and it also has a geometric meaning because it reflects the geometry within the tetrahedron. So this seems to be an extremely powerful reason for looking closely up there and seeing what on Earth, uh, I mean, what on Mars is going on. Now, it doesn't prove that these mounds are artificial to say that they are not randomly placed. There are geological laws that produce some kinds of uh, regular geometric patterns on the Earth. For example, mud will crack in a hexagonal form. But we know of no geometric rules or laws that would produce uh, this kind of regularity in a series of mounds. And as far as we've been able to find out, no geology uh, does do so. So these are highly enigmatic and require research. To know more about all of this and to find out ultimately if these things are artificial, we have to get better photographs. There is a Mars global surveyor on its way to Mars now. Unfortunately, the Russian spacecraft has crashed, so we can't rely on it. And on the Mars global surveyor is a camera that is the result of the work of a private contractor with NASA. It's the first time ever that the camera facility on one of NASA's spacecraft has been under the control of a private contractor who has a contract granting him proprietary period during which, of six months, during which he need not release any photos other than the ones he chooses to release. So he can, if he wishes, keep any photos taken uh, in his own lab, work on them for six months before letting them out. He can choose if he wishes to let some out sooner, but uh, he does have that option. Furthermore, that particular private contractor is very highly biased against this theory and thinks that it is ridiculous and has issued statements expressing utter contempt for anyone who even fancies this for a moment. And you can see his material on his web page. And his web page is available through my web page, if you want to make the link. His name is Dr. Michael Malin, and um, he has a web page. I'll give you now my web page address, which is www. And then all one word, it's easy to remember, McDaniel Report, all one word. All these are lowercase letters. www. all one word, McDaniel Report. Dot com. So www.mcdanielreport.com. Very, very easy to remember. And if you access it, you'll also be able to then link up with uh, several other web pages by Dr. Carlotto, by Errol Torn, and others on this topic. Uh, so you can find and look at Dr. Malin's web page uh, and see what he has to say. Well, I, I don't mean to uh, malign Dr. Malin, but the fact that he appears heavily biased is important because the photographs will not be taken unless high priority is assigned to those particular objects and no priority of any significance has yet been assigned to them. And in fact, the head of NASA, Daniel Golden, has said we can't assign high priority to everything. So instead, he's going to photograph something with very high priority. What is it? The Viking landers sitting on the surface of Mars. That's very high priority. I don't know why. I don't care what they look like. I know they're artificial. <laughs> um, but it, is, it seems askew to me, slightly askew, to give priority to the Viking landers and not give priority to some of this material. 
So we don't know how to produce a turnabout in this NASA attitude. And I warn you to be careful, because NASA has made many statements that sound accommodating. They say, we will try to get these pictures. But then when you say, what priority will you assign them? They say, well, you can't assign high priority to everything. <laughs> so it's very suspect. And right at the present time, I have to say, I'm very uncertain. The chances are high that we will not see photos of this again. Uh, I don't know how to account for it. On my web page, there's a recommendation form you can send in. I'm tailoring one now for people outside the United States. Right now, it's worded so that it sounds like you're, you're in the United States. But uh, within a week or so, I'll have, I'll have um, it tailored that way also. And if you want to send one into NASA, you're welcome to do so. You just download it and print it, and then you can mail it uh, to NASA. So um, that's the situation as it stands. We have enigmas on Mars. We need more information. Uh, the establishment uh, through NASA thinks it's all silly, and we're waiting to see what happens. Thank you very much. Eric Von Denigan's hypothesis will have an increasing effect on society, science, literature, and art. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence is a concern that affects all of humanity. For me, it's like souvenirs of the past. Some of our human forefathers had contact with extraterrestrials. They were here, they visited us, they were in contact. Something happened in the deep past and it will happen again in the future. future. Author of the sensational international bestseller and the most compelling non-fiction publication of all time is back in London for the first time in 25 years to celebrate Chariots of the Gods 50th anniversary. Eric Von Denigan Legacy Night. In this two-hour special, you are invited to share with Eric his most influential discoveries and revelations. Learn about his incredible life journey as an author and researcher. Meet the team behind the highly anticipated Chariots of the Gods 360-degree entertainment franchise. Eric Von Denigan Legacy Night. Live streamed from the Princess Anne Theater, BAFTA 195, Piccadilly, London, October 15, 2016. For more information and to purchase tickets, please visit ZoharStargate.com was an area where the Mariner craft found some strange pyramidal-shaped mountains that looked uh, very regular. And at first, uh, people jumped at that and thought, oh, pyramids. However, they are three-sided pyramids. And wind erosion on the Earth is um, uh, capable of creating three-sided, faceted, pyramidal shapes. So they may just be wind-eroded features but they are called usually the Pyramids of Elysium. Over in this area, Sidonia, that's where the main objects have been found, and we'll be looking at that area almost exclusively today. Now here's that barren surface of Mars taken from one of the Viking landers, which was actually sitting there. Um, this must have been taken from a black and white photo because actually uh, the photo shows reddish uh, rock, although if I'm not mistaken, they had to interpolate the color from various cues they get from the hardware. But you can see it looks like a desert and uh, rocks, jagged rocks all over, not an inviting landscape. Now on some of these rocks, there are little markings and one researcher, um, well, one individual who has recently written a book on the subject uh, believes the Martians uh, were out to uh, represent the ancient religion of the mother goddess and has interpreted or papers that have been done on this subject. This one is called the Martian Enigmas 
and it is a marvelous collection of the very best images of this material that have, has ever been published. It's by Dr. Mark J. Carlotto, who is a, um, an image processing engineer, a PhD with many, many peer-reviewed articles to his credit in the field of applied optics and image processing. And um, he is still an active researcher, having begun working on this topic since uh, 1987 or so. And I have another paper here, which I'll explain later, but it is by that same Dr. Horace Crater, uh, whom um, Ananda uh, quoted, gave you a quote from earlier, uh, although those who came in a little bit late didn't hear it. Other than that, I'm not working from my notes, because my notes were for an academic lecture, and this one is more fun, and I hope more informative. So I think we'll... Um, begin in a moment with the slides, but first just a very brief introduction to the subject. Um, in the 60s, and am I doing okay for sound? Yes, sir. NASA sent up some missions to Mars called the Mariner spacecraft, and the Mariners came back with apparent evidence that Mars was a barren, lifeless world, cratered. Mr. Sirisena, who gave me such a nice introduction, failed to tell you that he is one of the major researchers uh, who have worked on the images brought back by the Viking spaceship in 1976. And in fact, although I did bring a selection of slides over here with me, uh, most of them were geared toward the academic audiences I've addressed, and all of them were in black and white and shades of gray, almost all of them. So uh, this morning, he sat down with me and provided me with a number of his own slides to which I didn't have access previously. And so what you're going to see are uh, many slides processed expertly by uh, Mr. Sirisena. And I thank him very much for this and also for ferrying me. Oh, I, I must use the word whisking me. No, collecting me and then whisking me all about England in his vehicle. Uh, this is a little strange to me because in America we don't get collected and whisked. <laughs> <laughs> um, collected usually means picking up a lot of things that fell on the floor. <laughs> but uh, I have been collected and whisked most ad adequately by Ananda Sirisena. I want to show you a couple of other books and pockmarked and very like the moon. And the NASA scientists quickly concluded that it was like the moon in practically every respect and therefore could not sustain life. However, in 1970s, around 1976, the Viking missions to Mars sent two orbiters and some landers, and they brought back information that seems to contradict this and included in the images they brought back were the ones that have these unusual objects. And I will show you both the unusual objects and also the evidence that Mars may not be such a barren, lifeless world after all. So with that slight introduction, let's move to uh, the slides. This is a composite actual photograph of Mars. You can see some cratering here, and uh, this is a NASA uh, photograph. But that's the planet. Now, that reddish color is real. Um, the surface of Mars is largely uh, iron oxide, which is uh, a ferrous um, mineral, uh, iron mineral. But it's also an oxide, which is an interesting thing, because it seems as though a lot of oxygen got um, got trapped in the, uh, in the mineral content and might be recoverable. 
This is a map of Mars. This area, Elysium it's called, 